Hello, everyone. I need you all to be very honest with me. Okay. How many of you all, if you came home with a 30% on an exam, you know, in primary school or secondary school, how many of you all would have received one hot slap from your parents? Raise your hands. Uh, everybody, you know, and some of you all are the parents who are doing the slapping, so you all are also part of it, all right? So, of course, we're not talking about mistreatment of any children, not at all, right? But some of you all would have been finished because to bring such a poor score home in an African home would have been unacceptable. Now, perhaps your parents were on the other side. They were the ones who would give a lecture, and it wasn't just any regular type of lecture. It's the type of lecture where they talk about how they moved to this country to give you a better life. <laughs> how they had to walk 10 kilometers and jump over a crocodile to get to school. <laughs> how one time a goat ate their final exam and they had to rewrite it in two hours. Right? One of those kind of lectures. And it doesn't just stay in the house, right? You know, it goes from your room to the kitchen to the car to that family gathering where they talk about how you're an unserious child and you're wasting their school fees, back into the car, into the house, and then family prayers that night, <laughs> right? One of those kind of things. Needless to say, our parents did not play when it came to standards and excellence in education. Okay. So what if instead of the 30 out of 100, you know, it was 30 out of 52? I know some of you all are very relieved because you can feel that pressure from your parents even here, right? So 30 out of 52 would get you a 58%, right? It's much better than before, but you're still failing. And we all know that an F is not something that we want to aspire to. But in that case, right, if a 30 out of 52 isn't good, why is it that we've accepted 30% as some kind of target or status quo as to where we should be when it comes to women's involvement in business and technology, right? In, in the corporate world, we say 30% women on boards, right? When we have public events and speakers and panels, we say that there should just be one woman at least on every panel. And when you think about it, you're like only one woman out of five or six speakers? That's such a low target to aspire to. And as we know that we don't grow up with these low targets and these low aspirations, we've always been taught to reach high and to be the best. So why are we accepting it when it comes to business and technology? Okay. So let's take a step back. In 2013, I was a fresh graduate from business school, and I would moved to Lagos, Nigeria. Back then, life was sweet. The, the exchange rate was $1 to 160 naira. So I was a baller, right? It was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. Now, many of my friends in business school were interested in finance, and they really inspired me and encouraged me to start looking at investing in startups. So that's what I did. I started going to tech meetups, networking events, pitch competitions, meeting people, learning people, and understanding the ecosystem. After a couple of months, I started to notice a pattern. Right? The men were up front, center stage, and there were very, very, very few women that were at the events. There were always those couple of people that you'd see every single time, and those are the names that you would see on every single list who are always there. But besides those few women, the rest were either assistants in the back or they were doing check-ins at the table. Now, at that point, I didn't jump to any conclusions, right? I am a scientist, a political scientist, but scientist is still in there on my diploma, <laughs> right? So I took the time to listen, to learn, to understand the data. Okay? After a couple of more months, I went and I asked one of the main organizers, and I asked him, you know, why aren't there more women on stage? Or why aren't there more women at these events? And his answer was very simple. He said, we just can't find any. Now, at that point, my response was similar to what your response would be if you brought that 30% test back to your mother, right? I was like, excuse me, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean we can't find any, right? Are women interested in business hiding like a leprechaun? Are they a fable like Anansi the spider? Are they missing in action like my future husband? <laughs> right? Right? For my mother's sake, we hope not. 
Okay, we hope not. Now, I knew and I really believed that there had to be other young women who were interested in this kind of stuff. I was there, I had friends. So instead of turning to Twitter, you know, getting my Twitter fingers and start to, you know, bust people out, I instead wanted to do something about it. I pulled together a team, I found a co-founder, and we started a pitch competition for women entrepreneurs. Within six weeks, we had more than 400 applications from 25 plus countries. We had women from Morocco to South Africa, Rwanda to Senegal, who raised their hands and said that they were interested in these opportunities to grow and scale their business. They weren't interested in us because we had a brand name. They weren't interested in us because we were well known back then. They were interested in us because we were being authentic and sincere with a Google form and a website that I wrote, that I designed myself. Okay. Four years later, we turned the 400 applications into a community of 450,000 young women all across the continent and all across the globe who are smart and ambitious and focused. Yeah. It has been incredible building this community to connect all of these young women as well as this platform to inform, inspire, and motivate the next generation of African women business leaders. Now, thankfully, I've had a chance to learn some things about what it means to build a community of women who are active in business and technology. And I have a lot of friends in the ecosystem who will send me a WhatsApp, like, do you know a good candidate for this job, or can you send out this email listing? And I always send them my price list. They never pay me, but... You know, I wanted to share some ideas because instead of thinking about it from just a one-off approach, how can we make sure we are enacting systematic change and we're thinking about it from a strategic point of view? So first, it is definitely you, not them, right? Young African women are not some exotic zebra that's bedazzled and is lactose intolerant, right? We're not that special. We're fantastic, but we're not that different. Right? So if you find that your program is not getting a lot of applications, if women aren't seeing your tech hub as a destination of choice, it's probably because your program isn't designed with them in mind. Right? So I have a dog. He's fantastic. He has an Instagram page. Please follow him, Lucky in Lagos. Okay? <laughs> right? And if I had to leave him for three months, I would be devastated. Who's going to rub him with coconut oil? Who's going to update his page? <laughs> right? I don't know who would do that. And I imagine that if I had a child, I probably would feel the same way. Right? So can you imagine what it would feel like to go apply to an accelerator program that's in a random city very far away, far away from my personal responsibility, responsibilities and my friends and family? It's unlikely that I would want to do that. Right? And it's because that we've taken startup examples from other places and we've brought them here when they don't really apply to the demographics and the communities that we're working with. And if we thought more about flexible and digital training and learning opportunities, it would allow us not only to connect with more young women, but perhaps those who live in rural areas, those who don't have the financial resources to move, but overall a more strategic and more inclusive type of startup and accelerator ecosystem. Secondly, you can stay away from pink. Right. I know we've all seen those razor commercials with the young woman who's spinning in the garden, her hands are up, there's a wind machine, she's very excited. But at the end of the commercial, you actually don't even know that it's really for razors or what they're selling. Whereas when they're selling men's razors, it's all about performance and power and ba ba ba. And you're like, yes, that razor is really going to cut my face. <laughs> right? It's the same product, right? It's blades, it's rubbers. But when we're marketing to women, for some reason, we have to have flowers and roses, and, and I don't know what it is that we need to have, but we're doing something there. Unfortunately, we oftentimes take the same approach when it comes to marketing our startup programs to women, right? Something must be femme, it must have girl geek, it must be pink, and instead of focusing on the attributes of the program, how it's going to help someone reach their goals, about the success stories, we choose to just take a very low impact approach that's not really that thoughtful or authentic when it comes to marketing, right? So I think the way that we communicate these opportunities also can play a big role in how we demonstrate that we're actually focused on this demographic. 
Finally, we should listen and we should learn. If you need someone to build your rocket ship, don't call me. If you want someone to cook you jollof rice, still, don't call me. <laughs> right? If you want someone to write a very creative, self-deprecating Instagram caption, I'm your girl. <laughs> right? Because we all know what we're good at. So if you find yourself as a creator, as an innovator, and you're saying, I actually don't know how to position my product or service or how to get more women involved, there are so many groups and organizations and platforms and in individuals who've been doing this work for years. But very rarely are they brought into the conversation and actually asked for their input. Or we design solutions and policies and programs without actually asking young women what it is that they want. Okay. So if you're looking to turn your program from mediocre to excellent, you should take the feedback, talk to young women, see what it is that they need, and apply those lessons and improve. I really appreciate, now that I'm older, I really appreciate the high standards that our parents set for us growing up. It didn't matter who else was in the class, where they came from, or who they were, we were supposed to be the best. So should we care that the US ecosystem that has the highest number of female founders is Chicago at just 30%? Should it matter that Microsoft only has 26% of their workforce as women? Does it mean anything to us that Y Combinator has only funded 12.5% of women founders? Any African mom would tell you that's not your business, right? <laughs> It's your business to be successful and to reach your goals and standards that you know that we can reach. There's a startup fund that was really excited because they had 30 women founders. Um, they had 30 founders uh, that were women out of their portfolio. And I was like, why are you excited? That is such a low target. Right? So for all of us who are innovators, creators, influencers, who are designing programs, right, we should stay away from this 30% target. We should stay away from this number that we've decided is good enough, because good enough is not what we need. We need excellence. And I believe that African ecosystems, technologies, startups, companies can be leaders and can show the globe what it means to create inclusive and wonderfully made startup systems, right? After all, it does not take two heads to get this right. Thank you. Thank you.